We're in the middle of a 13-part series that we have been calling the Alternative Community. Uh, this is part 11, and I've titled this particular message The Identity Incubator for reasons that will become obvious uh, momentarily. But the alternative community is the language that we are using to approximate what it means to be the church. Now, I'm fully aware that the church, as a general Christian thing in the world, um, presently has a pretty bad rap. Now, you're not going to find in me any effort to defend the church, to defend Christianity. I'm actually more with those who are standing on the outside critiquing the thing, even as I stand here as a quote-unquote preacher. Um, I don't like Christianity. I don't like religion in general. Um, I like Jesus. He's beautiful. He's amazing. But there's a whole lot of baggage that comes with commercialized, politicized Christianity. So you have a lot of people who are like, laying claim to the name of Jesus in order to build voting blocks, basically. And we need to back up and ask ourselves, are we pigeonholing Jesus into any particular political party or religious affiliation anywhere on the spectrum? Or does Jesus somehow kind of ride above the whole thing that we might call imperial Christianity or nationalistic Christianity or Americanized Christianity. Uh, does, does, are these synonyms, to be an American and to be a Christian, are those synonyms? I would say no, they're not synonyms. In fact, I would go a step further and I would say there are people who would not identify as Christians who are more Christian than those who've hijacked the name Christian and are not reflective of the love of God. So alternative community is a way that we are trying to wrap our minds around this revolutionary phenomenon in human history that was set in motion by the person of Jesus Christ. What does that look like? Well, we spent 10 times together exploring what the alternative community looks like. Now we're on number 11. Now, in this time together, I want to introduce to you an iconic figure that you're no doubt familiar with. Kurt Cobain is probably the most iconic alternative figure of our times. Kurt Cobain didn't want to be iconic. In fact, you could define Kurt Cobain's life, his music, even his suicide as a rather violent protest against the commercialization of the human being. Essentially, what he wanted was to say something, and he didn't want corporations preying on what he had to say in order to ka-ching, ka-ching, make money. So he was constantly pushing back on the corporate American music industry and essentially said, leave me alone. I don't want your money. I want to say something. Please listen to what I'm saying. Now, one of the things he said, probably the lyric that is most popular is from Smells Like Teen Spirit. And in this song, Cobain reveals exactly what the alternative view is that he had of the human being and of art. He says, with the lights out, it's less dangerous. This is metaphoric for human beings taking refuge in coping mechanisms and masks and receding into the darkness because to be yourself in the light will involve critique and rejection. So Cobain is saying in the first line, listen, I'm coming to you and I'm hiding behind my art. I'm hiding behind my music. There's something going on inside of me and I'm going to reveal it to you incrementally in my 
heart. So then he says, putting words in the mouth of the audience, the fans. And what he perceives in the fan base, the commercialized fan base, what he perceives is this kind of sentiment. Here we are now, entertain us. I feel stupid and contagious. Why are you copying me? Why do you want to dress like me as an entertainer? Why do you want to be like me? Don't be like me, be like you. Be you, don't be me. Here we are now, entertain us. Well, I'm not an entertainer. I know you want me to be, I'm not. I have something to say. I'm critiquing the entire entertainment enterprise, in fact. Here we are now, entertain us. This is the audience to the artist. Do something to make us laugh. Do something to make us feel sad. Do something to make us feel happy. Sing us a romantic love song so that we can justify our infidelities. Tell us something that we want to hear, not what you have to say. He says, I feel stupid in this system I feel like a contagion. People are copying me, doing what I do. Do what you do. Be you. Here we are now. Entertain us. I'm worse, he says in the song. This is so profound. I'm worse at what I do best. I'm an artist. I play guitar. I write songs. I sing. Apparently, I'm pretty good at it because people are gathering together to listen to my concerts, and I'm worse at it because I don't fit the mold of entertainer, celebrity. I don't want to be that. I'm trying to tell you something. Could you please listen to what I'm trying to tell you and quit buying my records? He was known at times to tell the whole group of people, thousands, tens of thousands of people, you know, closing the concert by saying, the last thing I want you to do is buy my albums. Please don't. Our little group, he says, Well, he says he feels blessed with this giftedness that he has, and he's hopeful that our little group, you know, the drummer, the other guitarist, the bass, I'm hoping that we'll always be together and until the end. Well, they weren't because, of course, Kurt Cobain ended his life in 1994. With the lights out, the song in its refrain says, It's less dangerous. Here we are now, entertain us. I feel stupid, I feel contagious. Here we are now, entertain us. Entertain us, that's what we want. Listen, listen. Cobain's music and suicide were or could be looked at as a confrontational critique of the commodification of human beings. He was saying, I'm not for sale. My voice is not for sale. I have something to say. I want you to hear it, not buy it. This was the message. And there's a very strange sense in which this message shows up in popular art. In fact, Cobain's suicide, his music itself, some of it lyrically, and his suicide, interestingly enough, are a kind of, I put it in quote marks, a kind of fulfilled prophecy of a 19. 74 song by the Rolling Stones, where Mick Jagger discerning the same commodification of human talent in the human being, saying these words, if I could stick my pen, which is an implement of art, poetry, song, I'm a songwriter, if I could take that pen with which I write songs and put it in my heart and spill it all over the stage, would that satisfy you? Would it slide right by you? Would you even understand what just happened? Would you think the boy is strange, that he's strange? If I could win you and sing a love song so divine, would it be enough for your cheating heart? I mean, this is, this is Freudian. He's, he's essentially saying, listen, do, are we addicted to love songs in order to justify our unfaithfulness to one another? If I broke down and cried, if I cried right here on the stage, he's saying, would that be enough for you? Is that what you want to see? You want entertainment? I'll give you entertainment. He says, if I could stick a knife in my heart, suicide right here on the stage, would it be enough for your teenage lust? Would it help to ease the pain? Would it ease the pain? 
Would you be satisfied if I committed suicide right on the stage? Would that not be the ultimate act of entertainment for you? Now, Mick Jagger and Kurt Cobain, they understand something. They understand that the moment money gets introduced into the picture, people stop saying what they really think and they begin saying what they think the audience wants to hear. And religion is not immune to this. Religion is a cash cow for talented individuals who occupy stages. Now, Jesus, long before Mick Jagger, long before Kurt Cobain, Jesus totally got this. He understands human psychology and the commodification and the entertainment industry that has pervaded human history. In Luke chapter 7, the story here is just remarkable. Don't miss any of this. He says, what did you go out to see in the wilderness? He's talking about John the Baptist. John the Baptist is in prison now at this juncture of the narrative. And the people are clamoring for his release. Give us some more John. Give us some John the Baptist. That was cool. We like that. Or, no, we didn't like it. Some liked it. Some didn't. He said, what did you go out to see? What was that all about? What was that all about? You went out to see John the Baptist? What did you go out to see? A reed shaken in the wind? But what did you go out to see? Jesus is probing. What is it that you, why were you paying attention to John? A man, did you go out to see a man clothed in, in soft garments? Maybe silky, blousey clothing like Mick Jagger or something? Is that what you want? You want a finely dressed entertainer on a stage? Is that what you want? That's what Jesus is asking. Indeed, those who are gorgeously dressed or appareled and live in luxury are in king's courts. Jesus is saying through the lines, between the lines, don't come to me and don't come to John if you're looking to be entertained. Go to King's Courts if you want to buy into the commodification of the human being. But what did you go out to see? A prophet? Question mark? Did you discern what was really happening? Yes, I say to you, and he was more than a prophet. You should have been listening to what he was saying, not critiquing his diction, his clothing and whether or not he measures up to your entertainment expectations for your person on your wilderness stage. You should have been listening to what he was saying, but check this out. Jesus just goes vertical with brilliance here. He says, to what then shall I liken the men of this generation, he says, and what are they like? Jesus is offering his own critique what are you people about? What's going on in your deep inner psychological core? What's going on here? Well, he says, I'll tell you what it looks like to me. He says, you are like children sitting in the marketplace calling to one another saying, we played the flute for you and you didn't dance. We mourned for you and you didn't weep. This is an ancient description of entertainment industry. Jesus is saying, listen, y'all look to me like you're just wanting somebody to make you cry or laugh. You're just looking for somebody to stimulate your emotions for a period of time in order to give you some kind of cathartic release from whatever you're trying to escape from. You look to me like people who aren't listening to what the prophet is saying. You just want to hear your voice and your opinions through the prophet and call it God. You want your voice to be the voice of God. You want the preacher to say exactly what you're thinking and what you agree with. So you can say, hey man, God's exactly like me. For John the Baptist came, and this is so amazing. He says, this is Jesus still. John the Baptist came, neither eating bread nor drinking wine, and you say he has a demon. So catch this, Jesus is saying, John the Baptist, this is what Jesus is saying, was on the austere, no, that's left. He was on the austere, conservative end of the spectrum. Out in the wilderness, wearing camel's hair, eating locusts and honey, a minimalistic diet. John the Baptist was way out there, and you said he has a demon. But then Jesus says, then there's me by comparison. The Son of Man has come. 
I'm not like John at all. Eating and drinking. Jesus was on the social, liberal end of the spectrum in his interactions with humanity. John's over here all alone like a cloistered conservative out in the wilderness, and Jesus is at parties, and look, you say, he's a glutton and a drunkard, a wine-bibber, a friend of tax collectors and sinners. And then Jesus says, but wisdom is justified by her children. Just keep watching because the way I'm loving people is going to produce children or fruit. This is astounding. Jesus is essentially saying, it doesn't matter if I'm conservative or liberal. It doesn't matter if the person on your stage is saying what you want to be said on the conservative end of the spectrum or what the person on your stage is, wants to be said on the liberal end of your spectrum. You just want to hear your own opinions as an echo chamber in your head and call it God. That's what Jesus is saying. Jesus felt the pressure. You can't read Luke 7 and not get this. Jesus felt the pressure to perform as a public figure. He's saying, I can't please you guys. You know, John was conservative. I'm, by comparison, I'm hanging out with people and eating and drinking and taking the invitations to their parties. You don't like me, you don't like him. What would you like? Very interestingly, Francis Chan, he's a, a pastor down in California, um, leading kind of a, a small group home church movement. And uh, he tells a story, this is remarkable, of when he preached to you know, a few hundred people at a quote-unquote church service, a worship service. And when he got all done, he went to the back, as pastors do, and people are shaking the hand you know, and uh, offering their critiques. And this guy comes to him as he's leaving after this worship service and says, I didn't really like worship today. I didn't really like worship today. <laughs> And Chan said, that's okay, we weren't worshiping you. <laughs> I can't tell you how much I love this. <laughs> My goodness, what a level of clarity here. This brings us to the point where we can understand that really if church is just getting together to critique, did I like the sermon or did I not like the sermon? Did you see the way the pastor was dressed? Oh, my goodness, did you see the way his wife was dressed? Oh, no, that song, I don't like that song. I don't like that instrument. Why do they use that instrument? They should use the instrument I like, the xylophone, for example, or whatever. You know, is this an event where we get together to just tear it down? Is this for you? Is church McDonald's for crying out loud? Is this Chipotle? No, we're not here to have you go through the line and say, I want some of that guacamole, a little bit more of that, a little less of that. I want some of that. Oh, make mine over. I don't like what you just... We're sick as a culture. We are so self-serving that we think we imagine, and it's mostly subconscious, that the whole universe revolves around tantalizing our aesthetics and our feelings. And Christianity is not immune to this. In fact, Sam Pasco, an American scholar of like a couple hundred years ago, he was discerning this. He traces in one brilliant statement the development of Christianity. See if you don't just realize how Clearly, he understood this matter. Christianity, he says, started out in Palestine as a fellowship. It moved to Greece and became a philosophy. It moved to Rome and became an institution. It moved throughout Europe and became a culture, and then it came to America and became an enterprise. It became a business. I mean, we got products. We got Christian products. We got paraphernalia. We got stuff you can buy. <laughs> this is amazing to me. We are now face to face with the very strange phenomenon of consumer Christianity, if that's not an oxymoron emphasis on moron. Sorry, I shouldn't have said that. Okay, so 
this is very strange what we're faced with right now. This is very strange. The Old Testament scholar, Walter Brueggemann, thinking very clearly, firing on all cylinders, says the U.S. church crisis has almost nothing to do with being liberal or conservative. Okay, Brueggemann, what does it have to do with? Because we're locked in those categories. It has everything to do with giving up our Christian baptism, by which he means our identification primarily with Christ, not a conservative or liberal political party that has hijacked the name of Christ. He's saying it has everything, the crisis in Christianity has everything to do with giving up our Christian baptism and settling for a common, generic U.S. identity that is part patriotism, part consumerism, part violence, and part affluence. And then we take all of that and we call it Christianity. Is this brother not clear in his thinking? Now, you can do what you want with it, because right now, some of you are thinking, Ty's not saying what I want to hear. I'll comfort you afterwards. I'll hold you in my arms if you want me to, but I'm going to say this. Here's where we are. Here's where we are. I experience this all the time, personally, where the whisper between the lines is preach, what I want to hear and don't preach what I don't want to hear or I'm out of here, implication, with my money. I'm not supporting what you're doing unless you preach what I want to hear. Whew. It's stressful, man. Sing the songs and use the music styles that I like or I'm out of here with my money. That's the, that's the sense. Now, there, there's, there's, some of you know that that I have a larger platform than this local thing that we're doing here. I've just been doing this for, for a little while, in fact, and, and there's a sense in which uh, we're doing storyline as kind of, you know, for me at least, an escape from a much larger public stage. So I've spent years and years traveling the globe speaking to multiplied thousands and thousands of people. And I was just reminded of what we're talking about here just weeks ago when I spoke for an event with about 5,000 people present on a university campus, six lectures given night after night when, and it was painful to hear, people came to me as I stepped off the stage and said things like, ah, we see you on television. We don't go to church, but we came today because we see you on television. To which I wanted to say, don't come and see me, go find your place in a local community where you can actually love people. It's painful to go through the process of realizing over the years as I've ha I have, that I have literally, no exaggeration, no exaggeration, I'm not making this up. This has happened multiple times, I'll give you one example, where I wrote, a scholarly essay on a hot button issue that is threatening the church. I shared what I believe the Bible says about it. I sent it to a small group of individuals who I regard as friends. And I said, could you read this? I'm about to publish this. I'm gonna post it online, publish it as a book. And one of these individuals wrote back and said, after 20 years of financially supporting the ministry that I'm involved with, said, if you publish that, I'll never send your ministry another dollar. I'd like to say that I was just so morally superior that I wasn't even tempted by that. For a split second, I said, oh, well, I better not publish it then. And by the grace of God, in the next second, I said to myself and to him in an email, Why'd you have to say that? Because now I have to publish it. Because if I don't publish it, I just sold my soul for the stage that you want me to perform on. And so it had to be published at that point. Not because I'm good, I was tempted. Seriously, I was like, I actually pled with him. 
don't do this. Why are you doing this? Over and over again. We've had it happen right here. We've started Storyline and we've had people say, ah, you said something I don't like, I'm never coming again. To which I want to get down on my knees and plead and say, well, is it okay for me to express my opinion? Or do I always have to echo yours in order to keep you satisfied to be here? So here's the thing, here's the thing. Consumer Christianity sucks. Quite literally. I'm using the word now, you know, in the exact dictionary definition of the word, like refers to like a vacuum cleaner, for example. Christianity quite literally sucks the life out of the Jesus revolution. And if we succumb to it, and we begin simply saying what people want to hear, rather than what we actually see in the text of Scripture, we've already lost the revolution and sold our souls for rock and roll. We just call it church. So is church a once-a-week consumer event? I mean, there's a stage after all. I'm standing on it. I have a microphone. My slides are nice looking. Admit it, they're really nicely designed. Yes. Praise God for Emil Rosario. I didn't design them. <laughs> okay, so yeah, there's a stage and we have rows of seats and you're sitting there. Listen, is this what it is? Because if this is what it is, if Christianity, if the church is a once a week consumer event, we've already lost so much ground for the revolution that the world will have to suffer on and on and on with the name of Jesus being hijacked for political and financial purposes. I'd like to suggest to you that the church is rather not a place you come once a week. So this building, for example, this is not the church. You did not go to church today. You brought the church in the building with your brain, your heart, your body, your motives, your will, more specifically, you brought the church with you as you came here today in your love for people. Listen, it's a 24-7 way of life, the church. It doesn't stop when this service, this event is over. Our worship of God either is a launching pad for love or it's meaningless. If it is not, if we're not basically the church, I asked you, Emil, the other day, I said, so how would you def define the church in a, in a word? He said, he said, the thing we do on Sabbath, you mean, where we get together? He said, I said, yeah. He said, I said, what is that? He said, it's huddle for mission. If it's not a launching pad for love, it's meaningless. The church, I would suggest to you, in the sense that we're gathered here right now, the church is an identity incubator. Listen, listen, in rapid fire succession. I brought him before you, to you before, but you have to hear the words of the Danish philosopher, theologian, Kierkegaard, Soren Kierkegaard says, the human condition is one of shut upness, wherein a person blocks their own perceptions of reality in an effort to protect themselves. So, so, there's a sense in which emotionally, psychologically, relationally, socially, you're shut up, you're shut down. Something has gone wrong. Something has shut down inside of you, inside of me. Okay? Albert Einstein says that part of what has been shut up is the inherent genius of every individual because we, in our shut upness, have narrowly defined the category of genius. Listen, 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 do not miss this. Everyone, he says, is a genius. Everyone. This isn't hyperbole. He's not saying, everyone's a genius, ha, 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 and then there's me. He's saying, no, in all dead seriousness, everyone, in Einstein's opinion, is a genius. But if you judge a fish by its ability to climb a tree, it will go its whole life believing it's stupid. Fish swim. They don't climb trees. Evaluate a person's talents and gifts and genius for who they are individually. 
not for the cookie cutter process that you want to put them through. The genius as an individual is not a special kind of person. Listen, listen, listen. Rather, each person is a special kind of genius. You, for who you are, have an identity that has the capacity to bring blessing to people in your world. To make people feel like, wow, I have a chance at life. Everything might turn out okay for me because after all, he sees something in me that I don't see in myself. She sees something in me I don't see in myself. Listen, so Kierkegaard goes on and he says, okay, okay, so now that I understand this, he says, now finally that I realize that I don't have to be like everybody else, that's his context, now that I realize that my shut upness is a part of the problem, I can open back up and he says, now with the help of God, I shall become myself. Ha ha ha, I love this. Not now by the, with the help of God, I'll become like the person on the stage. I'll become like Kurt Cobain. I'll become like Mick Jagger. I'll become like my favorite preacher. I'll become like my favorite author. I'll become like the, all the other Christians around. I'll be just like them. No, no, no. Christianity isn't, the gospel of Christ isn't trying to erase your individuality. It's trying to flower it into expression. So that finally, when you fully enter into the realm of love, he says, this broken world becomes a rich, becomes rich and beautiful and consists solely of opportunities for love. He's saying that when you really begin to calibrate your vision, when you really begin to see what's going on in the world, when you really begin to, rather than be shut up, begin to open up, you start to see everybody differently. You start to realize, now there's an opportunity to be kind. There's an opportunity to empathize. There's an opportunity to love right there. Oh, here's another opportunity to be friends with someone who apparently needs a friend. A human being can be defined as a composite of fractured and suppressed genius. That's you. That's me. Fractured, suppressed genius. The traumas that you've experienced in your life have imposed upon you a certain degree of arrested development. And finally, there are beautiful things locked up inside of you by shame and insecurity that need to be cultivated into expression. And if the church can't provide that kind of warm, friendly incubator for people to flourish and to become who they are, then the church is failing in its mission. I'm not here on this stage to entertain you. I'm here on this stage to tell you something about God as the focus, about you in relation to God as the focus. Go ahead and critique the message today if you want. It won't do you any good. It won't do me any good. I'll never hear it because the way those things go is they're whispered at potlucks. So I'll never hear what you think about me or the songs or, you know, why did he say that? Why did... Ask yourself this simple, profound question. Do I see the beauty of God's love for me? Do I see God giving me the gift of innocence and affirmation and acceptance and new life, regardless of the mediums through whom that might be expressed. I said some hard things today. I believe them to be true or I wouldn't have said them. I'll leave you to process them and to think through how you might Worship God as a launching pad for love in the real world 24-7. 
Hey, thanks so much for watching. We hope that message was a blessing to you. God's word is powerful. It penetrates into our minds, into our hearts, and brings about transformation in every aspect of our lives. Listen, we don't want you to miss any content. So again, we wanna encourage you to click on subscribe and track with the content that's going to be coming out week after week. And if you'd like to partner with us in this global ministry of taking the gospel of Christ to the whole world, we wanna invite you to become a partner in this ministry. Click give and join with us.